Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here. And in today's video, we're going to look at the scripture talking about the calamities that are coming up on the world. If you've been following this channel, you realize that we have found text that links the polar shift with the end of the world as we know it. In other words, all of those catastrophic events that we hear about over in the book of Revelation, chapter 8 and 9 and all of that, will be caused by a polar shift. This shift in the Earth's magnetic field will cause all kinds of anomalies in the Earth, both seen and unseen. And in this video, we're going to be talking about both. I want to start over here looking at this X across America. Now, I'm sure you guys have seen this already, but I want to show you something here. You see how the X seems to point to this small town, Egypt, Kentucky or something like that? Y'all correct me on that. But what I wanted to show you is the spot in which that X is marking. This is the map from the USGS talking about the most dangerous fault lines here in America. And you see how it's the exact same spot. Now, I've run some of my own experiments similar to what you will find over at Maverick Star Reloaded with the differences being the understanding that the Earth's magnetosphere is being acted upon by elements outside of our atmosphere. But in this video, I really wanted to concentrate on the scripture that talks about these events. So we're going to be using this book, the Third Testament of the Bible, chapter 55 as the backdrop. We'll springboard off into other scriptures like the book of Revelation and Ezekiel to talk about this event. But in this video, I want to concentrate more on how it affects us personally and what we need to do to be prepared. And even touch on a little bit of what's going to happen afterwards. I want to give praise and honor to our father for this information that I'm going to share with you. It's coming out of scriptural text, which means that you can look this information up for yourself. But anyway, we're looking here at the table of contents for chapter 55. It's a pretty long chapter and we've covered it verse by verse before, back before these recent understandings. So in this video, I'm just going to hit the highlights of these verses. So we'll be talking a little bit about the warning voice of our father, how nature is already letting us know that this event is upon us. In the section called Power of Evil Shall Be Broken, we'll talk about a little bit how this is all necessary for humanity to move forward. The next section talks about events that we see already, like plagues and wars and stuff like that. But it'll also include information on what we have to come as far as this pole shift is concerned. The next section, natural catastrophes and earthquakes, will be heavy on the pole shift and how it would affect our earth. In the next section, love and justice and the mercy of God, we'll find out how we will be affected personally doing this. We'll hear about the gauge by which we will be evaluated to understand if we'll be able to go forward or if we'll need to take a different route. Talking about that oil at the marriage supper. Yeah, we're going to discuss what the oil is because that oil will be part of the judgment process. And we'll see in the latter part of the chapter the results of that judgment. So let's jump right into it. All right, let's look at verse one. It says, I have said that a very great ordeal draws nearer to mankind, so great that in all of the history of its centuries and ages, it has not had any comparison. So this here is talking about the pole shift and how humanity has never experienced this pole shift since the days of Adam. However, the earth has experienced this several times even back to the days of what they call Pangaea. Well, turns out the breaking up of these continents was caused by a pole shift similar to what we are to experience now. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Verse two says, now you must understand that I'm speaking to the hearts of all of you and I am allowing my messages and warnings to reach you in many ways in order for men to meditate and to awaken to my law like the prudent virgins of my parable. So there is a reference back to that parable that I was talking about, where the 10 virgins were approaching the marriage supper 
but five of them didn't have the oil and had to go back to retrieve it? Well, it is in the third testament that we find out that that oil is the understanding and the compliance in his law. This is the oil. It will be necessary for all of humanity to live within the law after this event occurs. So when he speaks of having to go back to get the oil, he's actually talking about reincarnation. But anyway, verse three says, will the people of the different nations of the world listen to me? Will this people to whom I am manifesting myself in this manner listen to me? Only I know. But my responsibility as a father is to put all the means for their salvation along my children's path. So this is the sad part of all of this, guys, is that people are not going to listen when we talk about the pole shifts and how dangerous they are. Humanity, the way we are built is real weight to the catastrophic event, which for us will be the global earthquake that shakes down every building on the planet. But guys, if you know Revelation, you know that that's the end. That's before everything gets better. That's the kingdom of heaven. But by then, the damage will have already been done. That's what he means by some people will get to see the kingdom of heaven, but won't get to go in it. Well, they will have skin cancer and other elements created by the dangers of the sun, not understanding these prophecies and taking precautions by the time they realize what's going on, it will be too late. And they won't be able to go back and reverse the effects that the sun will have on us. I believe this is why there's a sabbatical year coming up in the year 2022. When you listen to Maverick Star Reloaded, he says we have less than 10 months before this polar shift. Well, that will put it smack dab in the middle of a sabbatical year, a year when we're not supposed to spend any time out in our gardens, planting, harvesting, cultivating nothing. Doesn't it make sense with our father's perfect wisdom that he would have put his sabbatical year to span the polar shift when the earth will be cooked by the sun's radiation? Well, turns out this sabbatical year, which starts in the fall of 2022, will be followed by the Jubilee year, which will start in the fall of 2023, ending in the fall of 2024, which corresponds to that X across America, which occurs on the first day of the first month in the year 2024. So all of this is lining up and the scripture is telling us, even preparing us, but who's going to listen? All right, let's look at the next section. Verse four says, Verily I say to you, that if at this period men do not cleanse the blemishes that they have left in their spirit, the elements will come as heralds, announcing my justice and my glory and purifying mankind of all impurity. Talking about the stains that we have on our spirits. We are in an age of repentance where every wrong deed that we have done, even down to our thoughts, have to be accounted for. We have to make up for them. We have to do charitable deeds, including praying for one another. And the thing is, guys, this will be a zero sum operation, meaning whatever impurity is left within us come this day will be made up for. All right, let's go down to verse six. It says the paradise of the first people became a valley of tears, and now it is a mere valley of blood. This is why today, when I have come to fulfill the promise that I made to my disciples, I awaken mankind from their lethargy, giving them my teachings of love to save them. And I seek the spirits who are destined to arrive during this period to give testimony of my manifestations and my word with their deeds. So here is while you guys are hearing this. It's not so much for your edification, but it corresponds with our father's plan and his will. He needs people like you, people like us, who are ready to separate ourselves from the church doctrines and get back to the truth. Even this third testament of the Bible, ready to help humanity move forward. Because see, we've turned this into a valley of blood through our war. Turns out this is why humanity is so dumbfounded by our celestials and how our magnetosphere works. 
The first thing we did with technology was used it to kill people. So our understanding of physics had to be limited, else we would have destroyed the planet by now. But anyway, look at verse 7. It says, When those chosen by me find themselves reunited round my law, the earth and the stars will be shaken, and in the sky there will be signs, because at that instant the voice of the divine spirit, surrounded by the spirits of the just, of the prophets, and the martyrs, will judge the spiritual and material realm. Now, it is my understanding that those chosen by me, by that I believe he's talking about those who are chosen to actually help humanity through this tough time. It says when they are reunited around the law. And I believe that that started in 2015. When it seems like that vibrating echo of the trumpet went throughout the world, calling many people back to his law. Well, what we're understanding here is that when these people get reunited around the law, that's when we're going to see this shaking. But notice how it says the earth and the stars will be shaken. So how do you make the stars shake? Think about that for a moment. We're used to earthquakes, but have we ever seen a star quake? Well, as far as we know, the stars only move because the earth moves. So we're talking about that much earth movement that it appears that the stars are shaking. Hmm. A polar shift is more than capable of doing that, guys. In fact, that's what I believe Revelation chapter 8 and verse 12 is talking about. When he says a third part of the day and a third part of the night won't be seen. That's eight hours that's disappearing. How else could we lose eight hours? That could only happen if the earth was to rotate 120 degrees faster in 24 hours than it normally would. So we're looking at this experiment that we were talking about earlier, and you can see how these eight hours disappear. I'm going to start it here as the pole shift is about to occur, and you see there's a jump. That's about 120 degrees, which will correspond to eight hours. But notice that this is the fourth angel sounding. These signs will be necessary, guys. Many people will see these signs and will get out of the sun and start protecting themselves and get back to the law and reading the covenant, which I should point out is the book of Exodus chapter 20 through chapter 23. Those are four chapters that make up the law, not the entire Bible. Guys, there are those who want to make you think that the entire Bible is the law. Well, all of the rules in the Bible should be followed. But not all of them consist of the law. Not all of them were given by the voice of our creator from Mount Horeb. I mean, Moses got a lot of rules and they are all good. But we, all of Israel, got the book of the covenant and Mount Horeb. That's different when he told us directly. Well, again, that's covered only in the book of Exodus chapter 20. Chapter 21, 22, and 23. And as we go along, I do want to point out that that's what's great about all of this. We have a lot of information from these texts that we're finding here in the end times, but they all are consistent and they all point us back to the beginning, all back to what we learned from the beginning. We aren't receiving any new rules here, guys. We're just receiving new understanding of the importance of the old rules. Then notice in that verse right there how it says we'll judge by the material and the spiritual realm. This is part of what humanity is going to go through. This is the big change, guys, but it's going to talk about that more. So let's go on. All right, let's jump all the way down to verse 15. It says the day the waters cease to cover the earth. I caused the rainbow of peace to shine in the heavens as a sign of the pact God had established with man. So this is referring back to the last time an event like this happened on the earth. This is what we call an extinction level event where more than 75% of all life on the planet will cease to exist. That's talking about bugs, roaches, everything is going away. Just like before there was a rainbow. Well, the rainbow this time will be the new covenant 
guys. That's the symbol of the rainbow, the symbol of the covenant. Well, this time it won't be a material rainbow that we'll see with our eyes. It'll be a spiritual rainbow that we'll feel in our heart. Verse 16 says, I tell you now, you humanity of the third era, that you are the same ones who passed through the ordeals in which you are purified. You are soon to experience new chaos. Now, this again is referring to reincarnation. This is some truly deep stuff, guys. He's saying that the children of Cain has been reincarnated into this time to be purified during this pole shift. That's definitely something to think about. Verse 17 says, But I come to protect the people instructed by me and humanity in general, to whom I have made myself known in this time. Listen, my children, here is the ark. Enter. I invite you. All right, so look around. If anybody's asleep, we need to wake them up right now because he's talking about the ark. This is how we are to get across these new floodwaters. It's not gonna be a wooden boat. However, these guys have been building on this ark for almost seven years now, I promise you. Verse 18 says, For you, O Israel, the ark is the practice of my law, and all who fulfill my commandments in the most perilous and bitter days will find themselves within the ark, strong and feeling protected by the mantle of my love. Now, he's gonna get a little bit technical here. And if you're not paying particularly close attention, you may miss it. You see how right here he says, for you, O Israel, the ark is the practice of the law. And I say it again, that's Exodus chapter 20 through 23. Go all the way to 24 verse 7 if you want a little more context. But for Israel, practicing of the law is essential to being within the ark here. Notice he said he's in the ark, feeling strong and protected by my love. But then look at verse 19. It says, and to all of this humanity, I say again, the ark is my law of love. All who practice love and charity with their fellow man and with themselves will be saved. So here is the ark for the rest of humanity. Those who are not practicing the law right now, especially those who find themselves in these religions of today. Talking about those unwise virgins. Well, are they completely lost to the floodwaters? No. What it's saying here, and I stress you guys need to pay attention. Through love and charity, can they also survive? In other words, if you found yourself one of these round and white stones that's talked about in the book called The Shepherd of Hermes, you got to start practicing love and charity to make up for the time lost, not practicing his law. And just so you can understand why this is so important, guys, these people in this group right here in 19, y'all got all of the possessions of the world. Y'all still have spending power that y'all can use to help these people in verse 18 because the people in verse 18 have given up on the world already and most of them can be identified by their impoverished state. So while they may have the know-how to survive what's coming, they may not have the resources to do what's necessary to survive. While the people in 19 don't understand the law yet and need some help there, but they may have a way of getting food or a tractor or something like that. So it's necessary that these two groups work together to get in and or on this arc. This is important stuff, guys. We've covered this in many videos. Ask questions in the comment section if you have them. None of this stuff is particularly hard. It's just not common knowledge. So let's go on. Verse 20 says, I have always given you time to prepare and appointed the means for your salvation before sending my justice to receive an accounting from you at the end of an era or a phase. I have shown you my love, warning you and exhorted you to repentance, reform and the good. So what this is talking about, if you look back in the days of Noah, Noah wasn't the only one who got the warning that this flood was coming. He was the only one 
that hearken to the message. Well, that's the case that we're in now. Everybody is getting this warning, but how many people are listening to it and being exhorted to this state of repentance? Repentance is necessary, guys. That's why you hear them singing the songs. It's all about repentance. It's all about repentance. Those are those stains, guys. Nevertheless, at the hour of justice, I have never presented myself to ask you if you have yet repented or if you have prepared yourself or whether you remain submerged in disobedience and evil. Now, this one right here, guys, you want to stop and pay some attention to. Look what it's saying here. There is a such thing called a judgment day. Yeah, sure. We're in the judgment period now where we're given the opportunity to repent for our past deeds. Get some of this blood off our hands, if you know what I mean. But that's up to us. It's our choice. We are within our free will to be repentant in this time period or not. And if you look around, most people are not. Well, that corresponds with what he's saying here. He's saying at the hour of justice, I have never presented myself to ask you, have you yet repented? Meaning, OK, so we're at the point of justice. He's not going to come down and ask us where we're at in our repentant state at that point. It's like we will all be at a starting point there. This is what the Hopi are talking about with that red star. This is what I believe the Messiah was talking about when he said we will see the sign of the Son of Man in the sky. Many of the people will wake up at that moment, some to remorse and some to shame. But it is at that time where we be tested. See right here, it won't be whether we have prepared ourselves or whether we are in disobedience and evil. Many people on that very day will still be submerged in disobedience and evil. But when they see that sign in the sky, they're going to get repentant. But the important thing to understand here is they're not going to be judged based on their past deeds at that point. So if we're arriving at the marriage supper, he's not going to ask us how long have we had the oil or where did we get the oil from? The only question will be whether we have oil or not. And if we are somehow able to get some oil out of those wise virgins, we'll be allowed into the marriage supper. Well, to that, I say welcome to the Coach in the Fight channel. We're pouring oil out like water over here. My justice has arrived at the appointed time, and he who has known to build his ark on time has been saved, while he who responded with ridicule and did nothing for his salvation when the hour of justice was announced had to perish. So, this guy is why we're doing this. This hour of justice has been announced and now it's time for us to prepare. So thinking practically on this, what we're talking about is an understanding that all of a sudden the sun will become our enemy. But when we go and try to tell people this, many of them are going to laugh or say they already know and they ain't really worried about it. And this is what we were talking about earlier. They may still get to see 2025 or 2026, the other side of this thing. But are they going to be able to get rid of their skin cancer and some of these other temporal effects that the sun will have? I don't know, guys. That's actually my biggest concern. All of a sudden, Revelation chapter 7 verse 16 makes perfect sense. As he's talking about the 144,000 and that multitude that no man can number. It's saying how one of the things he's doing to protect them is not letting the sun shine on them or receiving any heat. This is what obedience to the law does for us. The example we was given in the book of Exodus was that after keeping the Passover, a pillar in the form of a cloud during the day and fire at night led these people through the wilderness, escaping war, finding water, food, and everything they needed, all while them not understanding that they were in danger in the first place and was even complaining about it. Well, that's the case we'll find ourselves in now. People who already have the law, people who already have the oil, will be led away from the sun and away from the heat, some of which will be complaining why do we have to live in the country? 
If you think you're hearing wisdom or knowledge, it's coming from this scripture. Now, let's drop down here in a section called the power of evil shall be broken. Let's drop all the way down to verse 25, which says, but before my kingdom is established, I will have to battle evil. For it is necessary that I wage war and destroy all evil to give you the peace of my spirit. Now, this is the net effect on the world, guys. This is why it will be an extinction level event is because it's necessary to destroy all evil. But the good part in all of it is, is this why we will have a kingdom of heaven at all? We're always telling you how in the kingdom of heaven there will be no war. There will be no hatred. There will be no sin. There will be no sicknesses or illnesses. Not even death will have an effect on humanity during this time. Well, none of this could be possible, guys, if there was still evil in the world. A lot of this comes with knowledge of a higher understanding of what's really going on here. And if there are still those who have a desire to kill each other, they will use this higher understandings to do just that. So it is necessary to remove all evil from the world before we can have this kingdom of peace that he talks about. Verse 27 says that a new world is in preparation. The new generations are about to arrive. But before that occurs, it is necessary to separate the hungry wolves so that they do not prey on the sheep. All right, let's drop all the way down to verse 29. It says, but the hour of the conscious approaches. It is the same as if you would say that the day of the Lord or his judgment is about to take place. Then shame will rise in some and remorse in others. So this is what will happen. This is the great awakening. This is the day of the Lord. This is that event that's going to change humanity. See, what we learn is that when humanity goes through this pole shift, when the world goes through this pole shift, this reversed electromagnetic field will have a change on certain species on the planet. It talks about how some creatures will become violent and some will become peaceful. I think this is why we're given the example of the locust so much in the Bible, even though other scripture says Many of the animals will rise up. Some we don't even recognize will come out of the woods, but it talks primarily about locusts. And I personally believe that the reason why we hear about the locusts is because we can get an understanding that we don't understand what's going on. In other words, we know that something is triggering these grasshoppers to turn into locusts, but we don't know what it is. Well, when you put two and two together, we find out that it is these electromagnetic fields that's having an action on these locusts and changing them from peaceful critters to violent, destructive animals. And it's not just going to be the bugs. It's going to be the mammals and even the people, too. Well, when this happens, as far as we're concerned, humans, this is going to be the hour of the conscious. The time in which our conscious, which is otherwise beat down and kept suppressed. This changes at the end of the pole shift. And when it happens, humanity will be awakened. But look right here where it says some will arise to shame while others will arise to remorse. And the difference is that the shameful people, they're going to get mad. They're going to get angry. They're going to blaspheme. While the remorseful people, they're going to get right. They're going to regret their actions and try to correct them. But anyway, all right, look at verse 30. It says those who listen to that inner voice burning and inflexible will feel within them the fire that devours. See this too, guys, you remember the book of Revelation talks about voices. This is the voice that he's talking about. This voice that's going to be coming from within is actually going to be our conscious. But. There's some scripture that imply that we're going to get questioned on this voice. Like somehow some of us are going to get led down to the municipalities and have to stand before the judge and confess that we're actually hearing these voices. While others will deny that they're hearing the voice. Well, 
This is what the Messiah means when he says that if you deny him before man, he will deny you. So when you start hearing these voices, understand where they're coming from. They're not aliens. Ain't no such thing as aliens, guys. These are spirit beings living on these stars, interacting with man on a spirit to spirit level. They're using that idea of aliens to trick us, guys. Like I said, there are no such thing as aliens. There are definitely species living on other planets. They may be humanoid, they may look like us, or they may look like something else, but they have bodies and they're on three dimensional space like we are on other planets in the universe and outside of our universe. But guys, E equals MC squared means they can never get here. They tell us that these planets are millions and millions of light years away. Well, that means that even if they were traveling at the speed of light, it would take them a million years to get here. And because they have a mass, there's no way they can even approach the speed of light. So whereas there may be life on other planets, there's no way they're going to get in a material ship and fly here. Whereas what the scripture really refers to and what the Hopi really was referring to and all the ancient pictograph was really pointing to was the spiritual beings that dwells on each and every one of those stars up there. We learn in the text, the Third Testament, no doubt, that when we look at a star, no matter how distant, far, how many there are, every planet up there, every rock up there has some type of life on it. Spiritual life, that is, not material life. And they are interacting with us and helping us spiritually. But since man doesn't want to recognize anything spiritual, he calls them aliens and trying to make us scared of our spiritual brothers and our father's plan for our salvation. But anyway, let's go on. Notice in verse 31, how it's saying that those who caused this problem are going to get the worst of it. I don't know who it is that lives in that spot right there, but I would move. The way it appears to me, America could actually start looking like this that we see in the U.S. Navy map of future America. There's your X across America, guys. Maybe I should put all three pictures on top of each other. That's past, present, and future. But anyway, let's go on. Verse 32 is real deep. It says, it is necessary for an instant the heavens be closed to all and that they reopen only when from the earth comes up a single cry, recognizing that the father of all things is one only. So this is deep for me, guys, because it gets into the timing. And you know me, I love numbers. But here they're saying there's some separation between these catastrophic events and this cry that is necessary for the change of humanity. I mean, at first, I was thinking that the pole shift, at least the worst parts of the event, would occur simultaneously with the start of the kingdom of heaven, meaning everything was going to happen right there around 2024-ish. But after evaluating this verse and thinking on the other verses, it's like the bad stuff happens first, and then there's a period of time where heaven is closed. And humanity is struggling, trying to make it back on its feet before we all realize that there's only one hope for us. And that is our father and our uniform cry will trigger this change in the twinkling of an eye. Now, it's important to understand somehow man creates this thing. I got all kinds of ideas, nuclear wars. Who knows what CERN's truly doing over there? And I hear that China, who plans to build a hydrogen collider many, many times bigger than CERN, is already testing fusion reactors. Now, I know you know about nuclear power, guys, and how it runs many of our homes, but that's fission. That's easy. The sun runs on fusion. That's that's different, but they already have reactors and are running experiments. So who knows what could actually trigger these events? But notice in verse 36, he says, 
I shall permit the hand of man to carry out destruction, death, and war, but only to a certain point. Beyond that limit, the depravity, the obfuscation, and the ambition of men shall not pass. This is talking about that pole shift, guys. This is what's going to stop all of this. That is when my scythe shall come and with wisdom reap according to my will. For my scythe is of life, of love, and of true justice. As for you, people, pray and keep vigil. So, we don't really have much to worry about. I mean, as long as we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, we're going to be all right. And even the ones that are not are going to be given a chance to get right. We just need to pray and keep on watch like it tells us there. Then look at verse 39. It says, And so the merchants of science will be driven from the temple of wisdom because they profane the truth and enrich themselves with the light. You can already see this, guys. Your first dose of it was the pandemic. Well, when it comes to the pole shift, it's the same way. You have a lot of people sounding very scientific speaking on this subject with a juvenile understanding of electromagnetism. All while scriptural text explains these events in great detail. Carved in stones dated back to before human history, you can find details of these events that scientists are still yet trying to explain. And it seems to me that they're having such a hard time explaining these things is because they're trying to leave our father out of it. And when they see text that explains things like the Big Bang, they have to somehow reinvent the story to make it seem random. Well, how can you expect wisdom to be on your side when you're trying to hide the truth? That don't even make sense. Look at verse 40. He says, The great nations rise up, proclaiming their might, menacing the world with their weapons and boasting of their intelligence and their science, not realizing how fragile is the false world they have created. For a small touch of my justice shall be sufficient to make that artificial world disappear. Yeah, guys, just a small taste of his judgment. And what is that judgment? Letting us reap the fruit that we have planted and cultivated. See, he is our protector. And all it takes is for him to lift his hand as of protection and we will kill ourselves. Verse 41 says, it shall be the hand of man which destroys his own works. It shall be his own mind that invents the means of exterminating what he has created. And I'm trying to, like I said, I'm, I'm got a several ideas here on how man has done this even dating back to the first nuclear bombs. Now, I haven't had time to think on this, but look at these dates here. These are the top 10 nuclear bombs ever set off on our planet. Now, I know many of you are not scientists, but the one thing you must understand here is that any nuclear bomb will create an electromagnetic pulse. Well, the whole problem with the pole shift is it is a shift in our electromagnetic field. See the relationship? So when you're looking at these biggest bombs here and you understand how our celestial clock is on a 19 year cycle that we call the Metonic cycle, you realize that through our explosions, we could have actually created this null in our solar system. In other words, we set off these bombs back there in the 50s and the 60s. And if these bombs had an effect in the outer atmosphere, it could be possible that we are transitioning through these zones every 19 years. The thing about the time period we live in now, not only are we about to go through one of these zones, but the sun itself is about to have a change in its magnetic field, which it does every 11 and a half years. Some predicting November of 2024. So it could be the result of the Earth transitioning through a null in the electromagnetic field created by nuclear explosions. Converging with the natural occurrence of the sun's polar shift, causing the poles on our planet to reverse. And in the middle of this reverse, 
all life on the surface of the planet will be exposed to this deadly radiation from the sun. This is why they're building tunnels on the ground, guys. But notice in verse 42, he says, I shall cause to remain standing all of those human works that have brought healthy fruits to men. Meaning that he has a plan, guys. He knows what he's doing. Only the evil is going away. So we don't have too much to worry about. Verse 43 says, Upon the ruins created and destroyed by materialistic humanity, a new world shall arise whose foundations shall be an experience and which will have in its purpose the idea of spiritual elevation. This brings me back to that Hopi thing, guys, where it seems as though humanity has two paths to be on. One path is an urban path where we're all living together. And the other path is the rural path where we're relying off of the land and living with nature. Well, that's where we're returning to. During this transition period, we're going to have to learn how to feed ourselves. You could imagine that if that fault line were to open up, our economy would collapse. Which means that the Walmart trucks will stop running and those who love the convenience of the Walmart shopping experience will suffer while those who are dependent on those trucks will perish as humanity returns to husbandry and growing our own food. Look down there, verse 47. He says, fields will be covered with the dead. The innocent will also perish. Some will die by fire, others by hunger, others by war. The earth will tremble, the elements will be moved. Lava will flow from the mountains and the seas will become turbulent. In other words, there's no way to hide, there's no way to run. We have only one art to survive this. We talked about it earlier. It is the practice of the law, the book of the covenant. Notice how it says the innocent will also perish. These are people who thinking that they did no wrong in this life would have not done necessary to make up for things they did in previous lives. So therefore they'll have to suffer these ordeals, some of which will actually take them into the spirit world. It's necessary that we get repentant, guys. And one of the surefire ways of making up for the wrongs that we've done is being charitable towards our brother. So even if you look back over your life and say, well, I ain't never killed nobody or I ain't never stole nothing. You have to remember, you don't know who you were in your previous lifetime. And like we talked about earlier, some of these people are the reincarnations of Cain's kids. So who knows? You could have actually been married to a fallen angel and gave birth to giants that caused the first flood in the first place. All that to say we need to be doing more charity, guys. You start by praying for coach. Verse 48 says, I will allow men to take their perversity to a limit to where their free will allows them in order that horrified by their own work, they might feel true repentance in their spirits. So now, how is man going to cause this? We talked about a lot of things, nuclear bombs of the past and all of that. But the reason why I'm not so sure that that's it is because of what it's saying here. It says that we will all be horrified by our own work. And if this is caused by some event that we did back in 1961, there will be many people debating and arguing on why it actually happened in the first place. So I'm thinking that there got to be something that man's going to do in the future that's going to cause this so that we can make a direct relationship to it. And it keeps pointing back to war. So my first idea for the cause of this pole shift would be a nuclear explosion, particularly an EMP in the upper atmosphere at the exact wrong time of the year. But anyway... I guess we'll all find out soon enough. Look at verse 49. The tree of scientific knowledge will be greatly shaken by the fury of the elements of nature and humanity will receive the fruits from that fall. Who other than man will be responsible for causing the elements of nature to become unleashed. So again, it is man that's going to do this. Who knows how? Now, 
Let's drop down here to this next little section. 51 is talking about epidemics will fall upon the world, strange and rare diseases before which science will be impotent and a great part of humanity will perish. But look at verse 52. It says the universe shall be cleansed of its weeds. Now, that's deep. I wish I had the vocabulary to explain all of this to you. A lot of this I'm just now understanding myself within the last few weeks. But guys, you ever heard the scientists try to talk about dark matter? Guess where this dark matter comes from? The individuals that don't cleanse their spirit and rise to the light will actually become dark matter. And if they don't achieve that light, by the time this planet goes up into flames, their dark matter is used to create another universe. Then 53 says, nations will be swept away and lands will disappear. This will serve as a warning bell for your hearts. So now this goes back to the timing again. If this is a warning bell, that means that the nations will be swept away first. Alluding back to that other point about how heaven will be closed for a period of time. All right, now that's going to bring us to the next section, which is natural catastrophes and earthquakes. But I believe we're going to cover that in part two. So I think I'm going to leave it there. Make sure you're subscribed. See you in the comment section.